Good morning and happy Sabbath once again. It's a blessing to be able to worship together, isn't it? It's a blessing to be able to be here and to worship with each of you and to see many friends again and uh, to enjoy a beautiful, no, it's not technically spring yet, but it certainly seems like a beautiful spring Sabbath, doesn't it? And uh, to enjoy, enjoy that as well. Well, as you know by now, or at least I imagine you have guessed by now, that we are going to continue to be looking at the book of Hebrews. And as we begin to look at the book of Hebrews, I want to look at what is, I consider to be the major motif in the book of Hebrews itself. Although there's lots of interactions taking place here. Have you ever felt out of place before? <laughs> you were just at some place that you really wondered, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. I don't belong. You and everyone else knew that you were a stranger. We don't generally like that feeling of being out of place, of not belonging. But in the book of Hebrews, Paul takes us to the concept to remind us that we are strangers and pilgrims here. You want to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. Hebrews 11 and verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These men and women of faith that Paul is going through here, they are strangers and they're pilgrims on this earth. Now a stranger we understand. A stranger is someone that is not from that location and is different than those around, right? A stranger feels out of place. But we're not just strangers. You can be a stranger and not be going anywhere. We're not just strangers. Paul says we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, in our mindset, in this country at least, when we think of pilgrims, we think of Thanksgiving and Plymouth Bay Colony. And they were pilgrims of sorts. They journeyed from a land that was their home to a new land. They were seeking something. But there are many pilgrims in this earth today. And there are many pilgrimages that people go to today. Probably the most familiar pilgrimage that people go to is... Uh, the Kaaba in Mecca, 13 million people a year on average, probably last year was a little different, but on average go there. Now actually, there's a larger pilgrimage site than Mecca, and that's the Ganges River in India. They believe that the river is a goddess as it flows from the Himalayas, 
And if they come and bathe in the Ganges, which is not a clear mountain stream anymore, that they will have absolution and purification and around 20 million people journey to the Ganges to dip in the Ganges every year. There are even Christians that do some sorts of pilgrimages. In fact, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, the longest pilgrimage on record is a man that goes by the name Arthur Blessed. Might be his real name, but I don't know. And he has traveled when the Guinness Book of World Records recorded it at least. He is probably, he still travels. So he had traveled over 40,000 miles beginning on December 25th, 1969, carrying a 12-foot cross with him. And he claimed at the point of time through 320 nations, islands, and territories. All seven continents, even Antarctica. And he does it as his witness of carrying this big cross that you can imagine would stir up some curiosity, and then it leads him to be able to share about what Jesus has done. But none of those are the pilgrimages that Hebrews is talking about. Hebrews has a much bigger pilgrimage with more than 20 million people going there throughout history at least. And he says to the believers in his day, and it echoes down to our time, he says, you are strangers and pilgrims. And I would suggest that when we look throughout the book of Hebrews, he has this pilgrimage in mind throughout the entire book. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. We're going to go through some sections of Hebrews relatively quickly. Hebrews, as I mentioned last night, is arranged in, by theological section, exhortation. Theological development, exhortation. We're not going to try to parse where all those are because there are some disagreements, but everybody agrees that that's the way that he is arranging it here. Verses 1 to 3 of Hebrews chapter 1, which is one of the magnificent introductions to one of the books of the Bible. Ephesians is also an amazing introduction. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He begins, he says, God spoke in different times through different ways by the fathers in the past. But now, he's done more than that. What has he done now? He's spoken unto us by his Son. You're familiar with the ways that God spoke in the past. But now he has spoken unto us by his Son. He's heir of all things. He made the world. He's the brightness of his glory. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. God has spoken even greater than Sinai. God has spoken even greater than through Moses. 
God has spoken even greater through Ab- than through Abraham. God has spoken by His Son. And then he goes and describes Jesus' unique qualifications. Verse 8, for example. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. To the Son, he said, Your throne, O God, is forever. Continues, says, that God says, the Lord says to him, The heavens, the earth will perish, but you remain. The Son, whom he spoke through, is addressed by God as God. His throne is extolled by God. He has the attributes of divinity because he is eternal. The earth perishes, but you last forever. He's greater than the angels. Apparently, according to Colossians, there were some that had been beguiled into worshiping angels. Perhaps he's thinking of that as he says, look, which of the angels did he ever say this and this and this? The angels are important. They're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. He's not lessening them, but they're not God. But Jesus is. And then verse 17, or chapter 2, verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He's God, but he's man. He became like his Brethren. That's the theological argument. Jesus is God and he's man. And we need him to be both God and man. Jacob saw the ladder between heaven and earth. Angels going up and down on. Jesus says in John 1, hereafter you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending. If you're going to climb a ladder, do you want the base to be on solid ground? But do you want the top to be solidly Resting on something stable as well? You want both the bottom of the ladder to be firmly established, and you want the top of the ladder not to be just on some wobbly branch. You want your ladder to be established down here and up there. We need our Savior to be established down here and up there, God and man. Let's read verse 9 of Hebrews 2.
but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Look to him. Look to Jesus. We see Jesus. Yes, he is God. Yes, he became man for us. Look to him. If you're going to continue your pilgrim journey, you must keep your eyes on him, Jesus, who is God and man. And then he gives his exhortation in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. One of them. We'll read just verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them Slip. We ought to give the more earnest heed to what we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Have you ever slipped before? Paul says, don't slip away. Another way that some translations have it, lest you drift away. Drifting may be pleasant for a little while. One time we visited my sister, not Cheyenne, another sister. And they were living at the time near Niagara Falls. And one of the most impressive things there to me, or at least that made a big impression upon me. Yes, the falls are amazing and powerful, but about a quarter of a mile upstream from the falls is a barge. I think it's a scow, technically, but a boat. And it's caught on some rocks there. Around a hundred years ago, they were, I think, believe they were dredging the uh, around upstream, the mouth, or not the mouth, yeah, I guess, anyway, the outlet to Lake Erie. And this barge, this scow, was being pulled by a, a tug of some type, and it was dredging or something of that nature. And there were a couple people on there that were running the, the dredge and doing the different things. Uh, and uh, as uh, they were doing this, the rope snapped. And they started to drift. And it was slow at first but they don't have a motor on this boat. It's, it's big. Uh, I don't know how big, maybe 50 feet. Maybe more, I don't know. You can't just take an oar and paddle upstream. And they know what's downstream. In fact, they can hear what's downstream. And what can you do? They're beginning to go as they drift. At first, it's just gently. But as you get closer to the falls, the water flows more rapidly. 
and they begin to flow more rapidly. They're doing everything that they can think of, which is not very much. They drop the, the probably the, whatever it was that was the scraping, the anchor, whatever, all, all these things that they can do. They drop it, and they're still floating down, and they're going faster and faster, and they get to a quarter of a mile from the edge of Niagara Falls, and something sticks on the rocks below. Imagine being on a boat in the middle of the river. It's very fast flowing at that point. Realizing that you're in a better situation, but a very tenuous situation nonetheless. What happens if you shift your weight? You don't know. I'm sure they were being very ginger in their movements, very gentle. Now they have another problem. There's a boat in the, not quite the middle of the river, but thereabouts, with two people on it that's now stuck there, how do you get out to get the people off of the boat? If you take another boat out there, what's going to happen? That other boat very likely can end up going over. They did not have helicopters, unfortunately. That would have been the simplest solution because probably they weren't invented yet. And so they are trying to figure out what to do as the people on the boat are just stuck there. You can't jump overboard and swim. The water is way too fast at that point. Finally, they decide the best option is to get on the power plant, which is like three stories high on the bank, and to sh try to shoot a rope out there that they can anchor to it, that then they can send, I believe they sent somebody or at least sent a harness over to try to bring the people back. I don't remember exactly how many hours it took, but it was not two or three. It was over the night and the next morning before they were able to rescue those people. Obviously, the boat was anchored pretty good because it's still there 100 years later. But they didn't know that. And when I read this in Hebrews 2, be careful lest you drift away. That boat comes to my mind. At first... Of course, there are other stories, and some of the stories don't end up as good as the one I just told, of motors that broke and boats that kept slipping. Drifting away can be pleasant at first, imperceptible even. But Paul is concerned lest the people drift away and go over a spiritual Niagara Falls from which they will not survive. And he appeals to them. He says, God spoke in past times different ways. He spoke through different means. But now he's spoken by his Son his son is God and is man. Look to him. We see Jesus. Don't drift away. Pilgrims are not drifting away. Their eyes are focused. 
on the anchor of our faith. Jesus who is God and man. We come to Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. We discussed that some last night. And Paul is now seeking to build up the idea that Jesus is greater than Moses. But in a pilgrim motif of the book of Hebrews, there's more going on because the wilderness generation were pilgrims, weren't they? All they knew was Egypt. And they were leaving what they knew, and we read what they say and wonder why in the world they thought slavery was so good if you could just eat some leeks and onions and things like that. But that's what they knew. And Paul builds the idea that Moses brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. They were on a pilgrim journey, but they didn't make it. They went to the promised land, eventually, some of them. But they drifted away in their experience, and as they drifted away in their experience, most died in the wilderness. They forgot that they were pilgrims. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Hebrews. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, he says, but we see Jesus, who was God but was made a little lower of man, for the, for the, made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. And he says, don't drift away. See Jesus, who is God and man for us. But now, he's relating it to the wilderness generation, and he says, don't go away like they did. And notice the solution again here. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. To not have the same fate that the children of Israel did in the wilderness, we have to consider and focus on Jesus as our high priest and apostle, the one that was sent out. Notice the solution to continuing the pilgrim journey. It's looking to the one that is called. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are what are they? Dull of hearing. I've got a lot to say. You really wonder what he would have said if they hadn't have been dull of hearing. <laughs> I've got a lot to say, but you're dull of hearing. Verse 12, for when the time, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, that which which ye be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. You need 
to learn again. And notice Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. They were in danger in chapter 2 of Hebrews of drifting away. What are they in danger of here? Falling away. Now, neither drifting away or falling away are good options. But which is worse? Falling is generally worse, isn't it? Drifting indicates it's more slow. You may have time for rescue like those men on the brink of Niagara. But falling away, there's very little time for rescue. And he says, be careful that you do not fall away. I read about a man about 15 years ago. He and his brother were window washers in New York City. They went to work one morning like they normally do. They were getting their harnesses on and whatever else they needed for their day's work. And as they were getting things arranged, they stepped out onto the platform from the roof. And as they were still getting arranged, they didn't have their harnesses secured and the platform gave way. Alicides Moreno fell 47 stories, 500 feet. And when the paramedics arrived, they were shocked that someone was still breathing. But he was. His brother, tragically, was not. He apparently had done what they are trained to do in extreme circumstances like this. He laid flat and tried to ride the platform down. Of course, he had almost no recollection of what had happened. And I don't remember how many, probably dozens of surgeries he had but he survived. He moved to Arizona because he had a lot of joint pain. And now he walks 5Ks for charity. The doctors and he himself acknowledge that it was a miracle. Falling away is even more dangerous than drifting away. And Paul says, don't drift away. Don't slowly, imperceptibly drift away, but also don't Fall away. Don't cast away your hope. Notice his solution once again in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Pilgrims don't drift away. They look to Jesus, who's God and man. 
But pilgrims don't fall away. They look to Jesus, the author of their salvation. If you have a journey, if you have a pilgrimage, whether you're a Hindu in India and you are walking to the Ganges River, you have the purpose before you. Or whether you're a Muslim and you're saving for your life th throughout your life to make that journey, that pilgrimage to Mecca, you are focusing on the purpose and what is set before you. The problem of, in Hebrews is that the people were not focused on their pilgrimage and the one that had led the way in their pilgrimage. They were looking to the challenges around them. Do we ever do that today? The difficulties that we face. Things don't go the way we want them to go. And we look at that and we think about that. And as we look at that and as we think about that, what happens? We get diverted from the pilgrimage that we're on and we begin to drift or to fall away. And Paul, throughout the entire book of Hebrews, is seeking to reorient them from the very first verses where he says God spoke to us in time past, but now he's spoken to us by his Son. Look to Jesus. He is the author of our salvation. He is the one who is God and in his man. Keep looking to him. You know, in life, it's easy to get distracted, isn't it? We get distracted by the common cares of our life that we all have to do. We all eat and all the dishes all have to be done, right? The lawn has to be mowed. Maybe not this time of year, but you know what I mean. <laughs> These things have to be done, and we can get consumed in the mundane and be diverted from the pilgrimage that we're called to be upon. Or the difficulties come. Our car breaks down. The well runs dry. I'm just making things up. I'm just, but you can relate to something somehow or another. Things don't go the way we want them to at work. There's stresses in the family, whatever it is, and we can focus on those things. And as we look to those things, as we focus on that, it diverts us from the pilgrimage. Or we get caught up making sure that we know all of the latest details of what is happening in our country and in our world, and it diverts us from the pilgrimage we're on. Or we go through One challenge after another. And it diverts our eyes. The solution that Paul brings to the first century Christians here is don't drift away, don't fall away. Look to Jesus. We have the major 
theological section in Hebrews, basically Hebrews 7, 8, 9, 10. And we're going to skip that over right now. We're going to look at that a little bit this afternoon. But we come to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Hebrews 2, verse 1. So don't drift away. Hebrews 6, verse 6 says don't fall away. Hebrews 10, verse 35 says, do not what? <laughs> Cast away. Now, if falling away is, dri is worse than drifting away, it seems in the context here that casting away is the worst of all. Do not cast away. Endure, you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise, verse 36. Now, I want to, I don't think we've read this, but let's, um, let's read 32 and 33 just to see what these Christians were going through. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Verse 34, for ye had compassion on me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. What is he saying? You endured a great fight of afflictions. You were a gazing stock with reproaches. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You had compassion on me in my bonds. By the way, that's another reason that, that matches with Pauline authorship because the author was in bonds. We know that Paul was in bonds as well. They had endured some real things. And he says, don't cast away. Then he goes through Hebrews chapter 11, this great chapter of faith. And right in there, verse 13, we already read it, but let's read it again. Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Don't drift away, don't fall away, don't cast away because you're strangers and you're pilgrims, you're on a journey. And once again, he presents the solution. Chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it's the same solution as he presented in chapter 2 and chapter 5 and elsewhere. Wherefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, you're going through afflictions. Yes, there's difficulties. And yes, you've gone from proclaiming the message to being persecuted to now in danger of falling away. But look to Jesus. He's gone before. Focus on Him. Run with endurance. Jesus is the pace setter. 
And if we look to Jesus, whatever is going on in our lives is put in perspective, isn't it? We are called to be pilgrims. We're called to persevere in our pilgrim journey. Pilgrims don't have it easy, but pilgrims have a destination. And the only way to persevere in our pilgrim journey is keep our eyes focused on Jesus and to remember that we're pilgrims. I read a saying, a fugitive is one who is running from home. A vagabond is one who has no home. A stranger is one away from home. And a pilgrim is on his way home. We're called not to be vagabonds, not to be fugitives. We're called to be pilgrims, strangers. Not to drift away, not to fall away, not to cast away, but to keep on that pilgrim journey. Dr. Henry Morrison records, as he had made a circuit throughout, I'm not sure, throughout mission fields, I'm not sure how long he was away, but a lengthy period of time. And as Dr. Morrison was returning home, his ship sailed into the New York Harbor. And this missionary that had been working to lead men and women to Christ was eager to be home. But as it so happened, former President Teddy Roosevelt was on the same boat. And as the ship sailed into harbor, great fanfare. President Roosevelt had been in Africa for weeks, months, going on safaris. And there's this great, he's met by the dignitaries and the people there, and the people are shouting, and there's this, don't know if they had a ticker tape parade then, but something of that nature along, and a claim for Roosevelt. And here's this veteran missionary. And he looks, and no one's there to meet him. finds a place to lodge, gets his train ticket, and starts his journey to wherever he was going in the Midwest. And as the train, as the wheels are turning and the clacking sound, he's feeling a little bit downcast. I've spent my life and no one has recognized it. And he contrasted it with the reception that Roosevelt received as he came home. And then the thought comes to him maybe you're not home yet. You're a pilgrim. You're a stranger. We're called to endure. We're called to persevere. 
and to, by the grace of God, regardless of the difficulties in the pilgrim way, to look to Jesus, whatever hinders us, keep looking to him, recognizing, realizing we're on a journey, we're on a pilgrimage, and we're not home yet, but soon we will be. I want to be faithful in that pilgrim journey. Do you want to be faithful in that pilgrim journey? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're grateful for Jesus that has gone before us. And Lord, we realize that many times we get discouraged. That we're in danger of drifting away or falling away or even casting away. But Lord, we pray that you will help us to recognize that you are the author and the finisher of our faith to look to you, and to persevere on this pilgrim journey. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.